Families have a lot going on. Let Ollie help manage the mental load with new cognitive help supplements for everyone four and up, like delicious Lolly Focus Pops or Lolly Mellow Pops for kids. And for parents, try three new Brainy Chews to help you focus, chill out, or get energized. Find these cognitive health buddies for the whole fam at ollie.com. That's O L L Y.com. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Today on CityCast Madison. 25 Madison area leaders signed their name to a letter calling for a Madison council member to resign. That member is Northside Alder Charles Miyadze, who now has multiple public allegations that he has domestically abused women in his life. Some of his alleged victims have recently come forward to their representatives, asking them to hold him accountable. Miyadze has responded to the claim, saying they're political attacks and majority baseless. We asked Madison Alder, Sabrina Madison, one of the voices calling for his resignation, why she and other local leaders are standing with the victims. It's Monday, May 5th. I'm Bianca Martin, and here's what Madison's talking about. Alder Madison, hello. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yes. So we've got a pretty heavy topic to talk about, um, but very important. I want to jump right in. What are the allegations against Alder Miyadze? From what I understand, um, two of his previous partners have accused him of domestic violence and a third person where it's, you know, the the claims have um, been covered in local media has accused him of sexual harassment. And when did you first hear about these allegations? That's a little tricky in the respect that With domestic violence, folks are often sharing their personal experiences with someone. They just could be at a place where they're not necessarily uh, ready to share those experiences publicly. And so I will say I've not heard previously from the two partners who came out publicly, but they're, you know, I've heard, you know, I'll just say that myself, along with several others in the community, have heard some of these claims over the years. I think it's just more recent. Again, how domestic violence works. It's a journey. It's a path. Not everybody will ever tell everything that, that they've experienced, but we heard about it sort of in real time with the, when the public was hearing about it from Michelle McCoy's Facebook post. So when the public was hearing about it, we were hearing about it at the same time. Right. That was the official, but it was, sounds like it, you know, stories were circulating, but it took that moment and people came forward. What have we heard from Alder Miyadze himself about this? From what I can remember from his statements, I believe one of his initial statements denied the allegations. I believe one of his statements then sort of alluded to past allegations and maybe I believe he, you know, took some sort of program where he can have his record expunged. Mm -hmm. And then that, at least thus far, I've heard kind of like those dueling statements from him. I haven't heard, I haven't heard from him directly. So, yeah, I've got one of the statements. um, He issued a public statement denying all allegations, saying they're, quote, entirely baseless, defamatory, without merit, and made solely for the purpose of tarnishing my reputation, this is his quote, in the hopes of influencing the upcoming elections. How does that sit with you? That's really, it's angering and it's disappointing. Also too, you know, I don't, I'm not sure if it's in that statement, but in one of the statements, he, you know, he mentions this being political. You know, we don't get elected. We don't run for office until late this year with the goal of being elected next April. So I don't, I don't know how this is political, but to take someone's, uh, having grown up in a household with domestic violence to make someone's claims around domestic violence and turn that into like, this is about ruining my reputation or this is sort of politically motivated. For me, it feeds back into this patriarchy that we live in where what you have done to someone, it can't just be about that. You know what I mean? Like it just can't be about the violence. 
coming from someone. It has it has to be another reason. Um, I should share this um, too. There's a quote from his lawyer who said, "Quote." Over 20 years ago, Mr. Miyaze was charged with domestic violence during a contentious divorce and custody battle. To resolve this matter, he entered a deferred prosecution agreement with the Dane County District Attorney's Office, is just what you talked about, which required him to enter a guilty plea to one criminal court. Mr. Miyaze successfully completed the agreement and all charges were dismissed. Um, but it, he's kind of anchoring this on 20 years ago, saying this matter is old and it's been addressed. Time to move on. W- what do you think about that? For one, I'm thankful that county leaders, especially from the Dane County Board and other leaders across the city, uh, stepped up to say, we have been hearing these allegations. These are not just 20 year old allegations. Yes. The two folks who have come forward are somewhere between 12 and 20 or so years ago. But folks, too, know that these claims are not just 12 or 20 years ago. Those are just what's public. And, I, you know, I'm not, again, the, the way that domestic violence works, if we hang our hats on being able to sort of like always have to see like the bruises or see a police report. And if that is the only way that we're going to deal with resolving domestic violence in our community, that also will mean that we will never rid ourselves of domestic violence. Because again, just because someone hasn't come forward publicly to the police or to the courts, it doesn't mean that their stories are not real. And, you know, I would imagine he's banking on other folks not coming forward and sort of been writing those statements from 12 to 20 years ago, uh, being old or, you know, no longer being relevant is what my opinion is. But whether you were abused 50 years ago or yesterday, both stories have equal relevance. I I like that and appreciate that. I mean, I don't, I hate that. (laughs) That, That's the case, but victims of abuse, it's in the body. It stays with you. It could stay, you know, stay with people their entire life. And it do- it absolutely does. Yeah. And to your note that they're talking about largely these two cases, but another woman has come forward on Facebook and said that she's been personally sexually harassed by Alder Charles Miad, say, um, and that's this year. And, you know, there are community leaders that are coming behind uh, this m- not just on the city, local Madison City Council, but also the Dane County Board, 25 leaders are saying that we stand in solidarity with survivors of intimate partner violence. And I think it's just that no one's claiming to be judge, jury, and executioner, but there's so much to domestic violence that most people who experience it don't come forward. Yeah, they don't. And so I'll be honest with you, most will never come forward. A great, a good number of folks who've been who've dealt with the domestic violence will not come forward. Oftentimes folks feel a level of shame. They feel powerless. They may be people who are very well known in our community whose personal status, they may feel like it may be diminished, for example, if they come forward with some of this. You know, have again, growing up in a household, I don't know that my mother's ever talked about, for example, abuse publicly. You know, it's mostly been an internal friends, family conversation. And I know other women who, for example, we support at the Progress Center where sometimes we are helping people who have, they're very well known in our community, or maybe they have a, a their job profile puts them in a space where they don't want their clients to know that they too are being abused. So it's really difficult. It's a really, it's really difficult. And to say to survivors of domestic violence and victims who are currently experiencing it, that the way that we believe you is only through the courts and through some sort of like, I don't know, photos of a black eye, for example, that gets away from us being able to really get rid of this. And not just for Alder Miyaze, but any other man who is serving in a high profile position where, you know, they're, they're very well known across the public. What we are saying to those victims of these men's violence is that we will not believe you unless you take it to the courts or we see some sort of black eye, for example. And that is not the messaging that we want to share with victims at all. That is 
that's why it was really, really important for me to sort of stand up and say, we believe you, you know, we are supporting with you. We stand alongside you because it is absolutely detrimental to a woman's anybody, not just women, men are, are being abused. Kids are being abused. But in this case, we're talking about women. So I'll say it is very detrimental to your mental health, your spiritual health, your physical health to not be believed. You know, it is damaging. I saw that there was a claim that Miazde actually went to one of the victims and offered money for them not to come forward. You know, hey, this might come up. Don't come forward. And they did not accept that money. But a lot of pressure, the pressure, you know, of fear, um, retaliation, any number of things. And if you're a woman, a mother, woman of color, the amount of things you're carrying on your plate, am I going to tip the balance? And, and to your point w- about the bruises, working in Madison like a decade ago, I remember a woman that I knew came in with a black eye to our workplace. And a lot of people in the community I was working in didn't believe her. And it was like, oh, she did that to herself. And I saw some of that in this story as well. And it, even if you have the evidence, it's still, you could be maligned and ostracized. Yeah. Yep. I remember getting a call from a local woman in this community where myself and the consultant that we work with both are sort of pulling over on the side in a row to sort of like navigate 30, 30 or 40 different phone calls and emails to quickly try to get this woman out of a situation and into some support, you know, and folks don't understand how hard it is to talk about your own abuse, to be abused, and then walk around in a community where folks question whether or not you've been abused or if you're sort of talking about your abuse for political motivations, you know, and at the end of the day, everything in our lives from birth to death is political. Everything is part of the politic body, whether my trash is picked up, whether there are services available to me for domestic violence are all political. Everything about our lives is connected to the politic body, but we should not use, none of us should say when we're being called out about something that we're being accused of, depending on what this thing is or how it's going, we don't get to say sort of like to blow it off and say, oh, it's political. Right. That that takes away from our ability to be to take accountability and be responsible for what we might have done. And that's a huge, huge part of this conversation, right, is accountability. And we're seeing victims asking for accountability, coming forward and saying, please help us hold this person accountable. Um, And you introduced a city council resolution to raise awareness about domestic violence that in and of itself didn't ask for any specific action. Um, What is your hope with that resolution? So. I try to be fully transparent wherever I can. And so when we started hearing about the sort of like discussions happening across social media, then we started getting the emails about it. In between the social media and the emails, I'm very much a um, the nerd in me asks questions about everything. And so even in this case, I went right to staff and city attorneys just to ask, like, what does the statute say? What, do, you know, what could we do? What are potential next steps? And a lot of what, you know, it's been shared publicly, too, around state statutes when you can remove someone from office and that thing was shared with us. But it also I was asking myself, where in this space do I as an elected official and as a community member get to publicly state my support for these victims of domestic violence? Yes, we just can't go and, you know, remove someone without without it being within the state statute. But how do at the same time while we're trying to figure out how to address these claims against Alder Miyazi, do we say we believe these victims? How do those things work together happening at the same time? And I was like, what are pathways for me to state that support? And one of the the things that we have to our disposal is the honor resolution. And so with the honor resolution, it was an opportunity for us who who wanted to say something to say we believe these victims. And I did not, I decidedly did not go the route where we will all just have, normally our names are all added to honor resolutions and we could just shoot a quick note to say we like our names removed for whatever reason. No, we don't even have, you know, we don't have to give a reason. I cannot stop an alder from signing onto a resolution, for example. None of us have that kind of power. 
But I asked for alders to make a choice whether they wanted to be added. And it was frustrating to see him at himself. But at the same time, I wasn't necessarily surprised because that's how domestic violence works. Oftentimes, abusers don't hold themselves accountable nor responsible and do these sort of like, they take these various different ways to show and flex that they still have some level of power over the folks that they might be abusing. But even so, I wanted us to provide an opportunity to these women, to other victims, to say, we support you, believe you, we stand in solidarity with you. And I also wanted to create a space for alders to be educated because two, not all of us have a, for example, experience working with victims of domestic violence. And so it also provides the opportunity to invite speakers from local um, agencies in to sh- not only share the facts around domestic violence, but provide some level of education to say, this is sort of like what's happened in our community. These are the sort of ways that people can get help. And this is what we really want from you in this case. So at minimum, I want survivors to feel supported. I wanted us to get information that we can use in making decisions about how we go about dealing with this matter concerning Alder Miyazi. Yeah, and to touch on something that you noted, Wisconsin law says that city alders can only be removed by the council when there's cause and misconduct while they're in office. So you're talking about some of the constraints here and what's possible in terms of holding Miazde accountable. I want to know, have you, did you have the chance to speak with him at all? Have you talked to him? Nope. I have not. As far as about this issue, I haven't talked to Alder Miazde since our last council, not this last council meeting, but before that council, this council meeting. So it's been at minimum probably six to seven weeks or so that I have actually had a conversation with him. Again, with the way that I've learned from whether it's in lecture, whether it is being in community on how domestic violence work and how sometimes abusers may work, I don't expect to hear from him or have heard from him. So have you talked with the women who made the allegations at all? Do you know what they want to happen here? From what I gather, I haven't talked to Jamie Johnson, but I have had a couple conversations with Michelle McCoy. And from what I gather from them and what they've shared publicly and what they've said to us is that they want him to resign. They want him to step down. They believe that it is not appropriate. It is not for us to have someone who has abused women in a position of power is not something that they feel is how we want to sort of like lead our city, like how leaders who we decide to put in leadership or who voters are putting in leadership. And so I think from their perspective, it is, it's, it's saying, Hey, here's an abuser with high levels of power, like with a lot of power. And we should not be in a city where our leaders in the case of Aldemiaze has been accused of these things where he gets to remain in power and not take accountability for that. And so You know, so you put forward, you introduce this resolution. Is there anything that the city council can do about this situation? One thing I want to make sure I I share is that at least I know for myself, I'm still figuring out what are potential next steps? How do those next steps happen? Those sort of things. I can't speak for 19 other or 18 other audits. I'm not sure what their what their intentions are. But what I do know that we can do, we can decide to censor him again. I don't know if what everybody's intentions are, if, if other alders are exploring that or not. I'll just say, I'm still, figuring, still it figuring it out myself. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I will say is that one thing I'm interested in is working with county and state elected officials because they've signed on to look at our state statutes because there has to be a trigger or mechanism in these processes to hold folks accountable who won't hold themselves accountable. And I saw in the, you know, Madison 365 broke the story. I saw in their, you know, article in terms of their censure and in terms of removal from the council, alders can only be removed for cause after hearing and a three-fourths vote. So that's, you know, it's a big, that's a a pretty mm, high bar, basically, (laughs) to make that happen. I I want to talk about kind of the bigger picture here and some of the context in the water that y'all are swimming in. Why do you think we didn't hear about this during the election? You know, he he won by pretty large margins in both 2021 and 2023. Yeah, that's difficult to say. My guess, it just really comes down to 
how domestic violence works, people oftentimes are scared to share their stories. And then they also don't want to see their story sort of exploited and become sort of like maybe a white versus black or female versus male kind of scenario. If we were in the midst of running for office, for example, this could sort of look very different where this could become something about like, you know, you all are attacking a black man, for example, you know, it could look very different. And again, I don't know why folks decided now versus then, but at the same time, I think it's just a matter of domestic violence thrives in like silence and fear. Like it, it thrives. That's why we have not removed it from society because the fear that is sort of like puts into a survivor's body and their mind, it is like next level. It's next level, you know? Yeah. And I feel like you, you put something really important for it. Something really that's standing out to me is about the politics here. That's what he's saying. You know, this is political. The election's a year from now. So I'm curious. I mean, if it was political, I, have you heard from voters who are upset? Like, is this something that would go to, you know, voters calling for a recall? I know we, we talked a little bit about process. Or might he resign? It doesn't appear that he's going to resign, at least up until, you know, this discussion we're having this morning. But there has been some conversations that are happening across social media. I will say we've gotten some emails where, and I I can't always say if these are his uh, constituents or not, but where folks don't want to have him in office. And then I've seen some conversations happening across social media around starting a recall election. I don't know if that's gotten any movement. I'm not sure what, what folks are going to do next. But I think right now it's what I feel is has happened is that the folks who have shared their stories publicly, they are now looking to us to do something. That's what I am gathering. They wanted elected officials, not just us on our body, but other elected officials to do something, to speak out. And as such as with the 25 leaders um, who put out that statement recently, that's part of too what they have wanted, that what they're asking for. And so I can't, my hope is that You know, he would look at this as more so because I just I just think about like imagine had he took a responsibility and accountability from jump, you know, what that might have looked like. Like the 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 thing where he mentioned Safe Harbor, then Safe Harbor with within like a day or, or I don't know, maybe later that day came out with a statement saying that this was not. This was not valid, you know? Yeah, he tried to say that he, hey, I've been a supporter of domestic abuse victims. Yeah. Yeah, that's what you're talking about. Yeah. And that is, I'm like, that now that is political. (laughs) Right. To say that you are doing something you are not in order to save yourself or protect yourself. That's a strong argument for making something political. What do you think should happen now? I think Alderman Yaz, and I've said this, I'm not saying anything new. I do think he should step down. I think that he has some internal work that he needs to do for himself because at the end of the day, I still like, for example, former supervisor Dana Pellebaum mentioned restorative justice. I think it would be smart for him to sit down with someone. I'm, you know, that's not my lane. I don't work for a domestic violence agency, but I think he should sit down with folks who their work is restorative justice. That's, that's their like from top to bottom. They are experts in restorative justice. And I think he should take the time to do the internal work and sit down with restorative justice experts to figure out what might restorative justice looks like in this case. And again, I don't know if he's doing that or not, but if he is, those are things that we would want to know, you know. But I think at the end of the day, I want to stay true to what these women have asked. They've asked him to resign. So I too will ask him again to step down and at the same time add an asterisk to do the internal work and to meet with justice, uh, store, restorative justice practitioners. Alder Madison, I so, so appreciate you sharing your time with us. This has been very helpful and, you know, thank you. Thank you. That's Sabrina Madison, Alder for the city of Madison, representing the Far East Side. I should note, we cover some pretty serious issues in this episode involving domestic and physical abuse. If you or anyone you know is struggling or in crisis, you can call the National Domestic Violence Hotline. 
That number is 800-799-7233. Or if you want to call a more local line, you can call Madison's Domestic Violence Intervention Services Helpline at 608-251-4445. That's all for today here on CityCast Madison. I'm Bianca Martin. If you enjoyed the show, why not share this episode with a person in your life who really holds themselves accountable for their actions? We'll be back tomorrow morning with more stories from around the city. Until then, take good care.